But well, the thing probably took off with a leak in the fuel tank, uh, the, one of the fittings in the fuel tank, and it leaked out the hydrazine. And when the Agena ignited, the whole thing blew up. And so they said, we don't want to do that again. And so they said, you got to get a, a sniffer, a mechanical sniffer, to go up there and smell and see if there's any hydrazine. And there weren't any around in those days that could do it. And so well, we, we scratched our heads and so on. Lockheed scratched its heads and so on and so forth. And finally, the, there was a guy in Lockheed said, well, I've got a calibrated nose. And so everything's all buttoned up, and someplace in the count, after they've got a little bit of fuel on board, this guy gets up in a cherry picker, and they take him up, and he unscrews a hatch on the Azena, and he sticks his, sticks his nose in and goes, <laughs> all okay. So now today, OSHA, IRPA, and all those other clowns would, would die, but because it's poisonous as hell. I mean, hydrazine is not healthy stuff. We had 10 launches before I went to Vandenberg for a launch. And the launch I went to was a glorious failure. The uh, Thor lifted off the pad and they'd made a mistake. And instead of going straight up and going over like this, it went up and it was a dancer. And they blew it up at about 20,000 feet. And here's all these pieces, and you're sure they're going to come down and hit you. So there was, first there was a mad scramble to get under something, and then suddenly somebody realized that thing's going to fall down here, and it's got all sorts of classified stuff on board, the film. And so there was a mad rush, went down, jumped in the car, and drove like madmen down to the where the thing was. And over in one corner, off in one area, there was the payload. And the front end was relatively intact, and so we didn't spread film all over everywhere. Eisenhower was very clear as this went along. He said uh, when I would report to him another failure of the so-called Discoverer uh, satellite, uh, he would say, don't worry about it. We're going to stay with this thing. We're going to bring it through because it's something that we really need. And he was committed to it and very steady in his support. Finally, Eisenhower's patience was rewarded. With Discoverer 13, the Air Force and Lockheed managed to put a camera into orbit and turn it on and off. The payload bucket was ejected right on schedule, though this test mission didn't carry any film. The falling capsule eluded the recovery planes that hoped to snatch it from midair. The bucket splashed down 300 miles northwest of Hawaii, where it was retrieved by a Navy helicopter. An encrypted message was immediately sent to Richard Bissell at the CIA. It read simply, capsule recovered undamaged. The Air Force, Lockheed, and their shadowy partners in the intelligence community could now breathe a sigh of relief. The months of embarrassing failures seemed to be over. When the Russians beat us with Sputnik, I think we could have beat them if we had wanted to, and that's the Air Force had wanted to in the early days. But the Sputnik wasn't much of a program, and the Russian attempts to put the dog and all of that stuff in over, those, those were very well done, to be sure. But they, they weren't really trying to do what we were trying to do. We were trying to put something in orbit, do a job, and then bring it back. So that the big race for us was recovery. And when we finally did make recovery, we had a very, very nice party. And all of the uh, key people to celebrate got thrown in the swimming pool at Ricky's in Palo Alto. <laughs> that was our big celebration of, of that event. We were very pleased with ourselves. So we said we beat the Russians in, in, in that case. that we cannot pick up. That's my motto. I've lived it from 40. <laughs> like many technological marvels, the mid-air recovery of the Corona capsule had very low-tech origins. The method grew out of mail pickups and drops used in World War II. Harry Conway, an Army Air Corps vet with CIA connections, was the most outspoken advocate of using planes for covert missions. In a series of demonstrations, Conway proved the technique by pulling crates from the sea 
and drone planes from land. To make his point that even delicate cargoes could withstand the stress, Conway himself volunteered to be snatched. And the aircraft comes in uh, with his pole protruding, and it has a bronze hook. And when he makes contact, and of course he goes straight up, I mean, climbs to altitude. And like with a man, myself, I'm sitting in this same position, just like this. And when they make contact, I raise up about three or four feet, and then you take right off. And their contact speeds are anywhere from, I think on a, on a B-26 it was 106, and that's almost stalling speed. But I was picked up once with a B-29, and uh, I took 59 Gs at that point. I had a hard time getting insurance. Air recovery was first used for the secret balloon reconnaissance programs. After the camera payload separated from their balloons, they floated down on parachutes. An air crew would throw out hooks to snag the parachute lines. Once snagged, the payload was then reeled into the back of the plane. The same technique was applied to plummeting corona capsules. To keep corona film from falling into enemy hands, a squadron of C-119s was sent to Hawaii. It took air crews months to perfect the satellite recovery technique. The trick was to figure out a falling capsule's trajectory, then to put airplanes near the capsule's path of descent. When the capsule appeared, the C-119 swooped in to grab the falling bucket of film. I uh, roomed with this Captain Bruton. He was captain at the time. So I says, Jim, what are we going to be doing out here? And he says, uh, well, we're going to uh, be recovering nose cones from outer space. And, oh, Lord, I came all this way to have a roommate that's a real wise acre, you know. So, so that, my reaction was very similar to, to most people's reaction when they found out we were going to snag capsules or parachutes out of midair with aircrafts. Discoverer 14 was the first mission where everything worked correctly. The corona camera took its pictures, the film bucket was shot back to Earth, then the bucket was successfully snagged in midair. But recovery crews were kept in the dark about the bucket's true identity. I, I think that everyone speculated on what it was, and of course that speculation was never discussed among people, and it was in the newspapers and you know, all this kind of stuff, what are the big spy satellites and things like that. What happened if they missed? Consider the case of Discoverer 15. We were, as I say, quite worried that the Russians or somebody would get this capsule with all the film in it if we didn't catch it, or if it fell in the ocean. So there was a salt plug in the bottom uh, of the capsule. The salt plug was good for, eh, roughly 24 hours, supposedly 12 to 24 hours. And if you hadn't gotten it back by that time, uh, it would, uh, the plug would eat away and the water would flow in and it would sink. And, and so that was one of the safety features on the doggone thing. And uh, in this particular case, the, the, saddle, the capsule came down way long and uh, they got... Uh, bunch of nuts that like to jump out in the ocean in parachutes and, and float around. And when they finally got them permission to jump, the, the cloud came through and it rained. And when the cloud went away, the capsule had sunk. And so we didn't get Discover 15 back. And that was a disappointment. Technical problems continued to dog Corona over the next few years. But from the very first missions, Corona photographs opened up the secret world of the Soviet Union to an extent that CIA analysts could only dream of in the 1950s. Photo interpreters began the laborious but critical process of mapping and studying every square foot of China, the Soviet Union, and their client states. Within just a few years, the U.S. went from having only vague knowledge of communist strength 
to knowing the precise deployment of Soviet and Chinese forces. It was revolutionary. In fact, uh, imagery, in a sense, is what set the United States uh, intelligence community apart uh, in the world during the uh, 1960s in particular. But almost no one can get in to a denied area and with remote sensing basically count uh, the forces and develop the anatomy of the uh, threat that's facing them. That was an American specialty until uh, fairly recently. But how would the Soviets respond to spy satellites? That question weighed heavily on high-level brows. In 1960, just prior to Corona's first successful flight, a U-2 spy plane had been shot down over Russia by a new surface-to-air missile. The intelligence community could only cross its collective fingers and hope that Corona would not suffer the same fate. ITEC's Richard Leghorn visited Moscow in 1960. Uh, we were sitting there in the Hall of Friendship in the Kremlin, and the General Secretary of the Soviets uh, Academy, who sat opposite from me, after two weeks with clouds all over Moscow, he said, Leghorn, you're crazy. I said, why? He said, well, you've been here two weeks now. Have you seen a ray of sunshine? I said, no. He said, well, why do you think you're going to take all these pictures from space? I mean, they were tracking our, our satellites, of course, and knew the whole uh, story. On average, cloud cover ruined about 40% of corona photos. The Soviets realized that the other 60% would yield valuable intelligence, but they decided to turn a blind eye to satellite overflight. The bloodless sport of surveillance was now acceptable so long as it occurred outside the Earth's atmosphere. Clouds turned out to be the least of the problems that faced camera designers. In the early 1960s, Corona's film often dried up and crumbled in space. This problem was eventually solved by the film's manufacturer. Kodak perfected a polyester-based film that could better withstand the arid conditions of space, where temperatures range from 250 degrees above zero to 250 degrees below. But the most maddening camera problem coincidentally shared its name with the satellite. As it turned out, Corona was one of the biggest problems that we had in space. Now, Corona, for those people who don't understand it, is a electrostatic discharge which results in a spray of light. And you can't have that inside a camera, <laughs> else you don't have any film on you get back, back onto the ground. So. Our ability to uh, finally overcome that problem was one of the, the uh, most important things we were able to achieve. And we brought everyone from uh, the janitor to Ed Purcell, who was a Nobel Prize winner of, over at Harvard, in on the program. And we had finally come up with what I consider a pragmatic solution. Eventually what Frank did, and this was Frank's idea, um, eventually what he did was he built a rig to steam the rollers. And then he took each one of them, put them into a camera, put film in the camera, put into a vacuum chamber, and if he got static, he threw it away. If he didn't get static, we used it. And that's the way we solved the problem. <laughs> By the mid-60s, the quality of corona imagery had improved dramatically. Resolution quality, the sharpness of objects in a photo, went from 25 feet to 6 feet in a handful of years. Corona data had already proved that fears of Soviet ICBM superiority were unfounded, though the photos also proved that the USSR was building up its forces in all areas, from atom bombs to chemical weapons. Chinese activity was also closely monitored, and by studying force-level buildups along their borders, analysts were able to watch the tension mount between the USSR and China throughout the 1960s. Later, President Nixon was able to leverage both communist nations against each other in the pursuit of detente. Corona cameras also turned up unexpected findings. In a strip of film shot over the Middle East in 1971, a photo interpreter saw a puzzling pattern in the sand. On closer inspection, he realized he was looking at a 12th century Roman fort. 